configs, but I really like using it. And in the virtual line, of course, that's your external IP. That's your virtual server. And that's just a, a pair of address and port. And then the method that uh, the, ad, or the request will be passed to your backend services. So the masquerade type, you do need to remember to set the network gateway to your load balancer, where you get some real cool things like uh, requests coming in via your external IP, and the responses going out over some other random IP. And then your clients are going to ignore that spam and time out their requests. Good time to troubleshoot that one. And then each real server, you could only have one if you wanted, but each real server that you list is one of these backend services that we're going to be covering today. And then the remaining lines are just how do we make sure it's healthy? So for the HTTP service and a negotiate check type, we're just saying send a request. If you get back the response you like, that back end's fine. Uh, you can also use things like command to write a script and just do as much work as you want, bearing in mind that these things could run as often as once a minute. So maybe keep it peppy. Okay, so we got our two evergreen stacks. They're behind L directed D. Multiple ways to remove them from the load balancer. You can do upgrades, maintenance. It's great. So you know what this means. I can't click there. Hey, we're good. So I don't know about you all, but Frankie's and Volturno's, they're screaming my name like I owe money. Go to lunch early. Or maybe keep going. So just looking at what we've got again, uh, we got L Director D passing requests back and forth, one and the yeah, to one or the other as things go, provided the health checks pass, which if you recall is just give me this file and what's this text look like? Is it the text that makes me happy? You get a request. I hope that works out. <laughs> so what happens? One of our back ends gets a kind of an ugly request. They flash every user in the database. Give me all their certs all at once. Or if you've got a large enough database, maybe give me every pre-cat item. I want to see it in the editor. This is not great. So a small enough database, it's annoying. Maybe you've got a back end that takes a little while to return. A bigger system, you've basically got a one-way ticket to the out-of-memory jungle, and some of your services are going to die. So as long as you've only gotten one of those, now you've got maybe that health check is still returning the text of your check file. It says, I'm okay, as far as you know, send me requests. And with some services dead on one of our backends, now we're getting about a 50% hit rate with all of our user requests. I can tell it's been a while since some of us have been in school. If memory serves, 50%, not a great grade. Don't want to do that. So the issue currently, once a request from a user hits Nginx on either of these back ends, that's the back end is going to stay on. So if it goes to the top, we're having a bad time. So what we do, what we can do next to kind of help keep things working is make sure that the open source routers in this top system also know about the services running on the second. <coughs> but we have to make a quick detour before we make any open source changes. We do need to make sure that each driver D will talk to each other on both of these machines. And usually most of the server to server module, that's the S2S module, is pretty much ready to run, except they've got this thing about security, I guess. So you've got to go turn off all the security, just like a regular Evergreen installation, and set the TLS and S2SU start TLS 
setting is both to false. And then that way they'll just talk back and forth. And you need to make sure that the mod S2S dialback module is also enabled. What that does is since you can't ask a certificate, is this really the server I think it is, or that they say they are, it just does a DNS lookup, which you know, internally, as long as you only have your uh, eJabberD stuff in your internal DNS, probably authoritative, probably safe, good enough for our purposes anyway. And then, of course, you need to change all your eJabberD domains. You don't want to use public.localhost, just public dot whatever the host name is that it's running on just for simplicity and once all this is also done you need to re-register your router and open surf users for your public and private domains like normal <clears throat> next the routers need to know what domains they should accept registrations from you don't just want randos on the internet connecting to 5222 and saying, hi, I'm a very trusted service. You can send me whatever you like. It's cool. So the routers section of OpenSurf core, the top level routers section, not OpenSurf routers, just to be clear, that's a fun thing to discuss with settings. Uh, the routers section defines the public and private routers to run locally. And it also defines the trusted domains that they'll accept registrations from, which are usually local also. But in this case, we want to add all of the other private routers or you know, private domains, say, because the registrations are coming from the services. And once we've got the routers allowing services to register from wherever, we need to tell the services to actually go register with these routers. So this is in the OpenSurf routers section I was briefly mentioning earlier. And you need to list every router that you want your local set of services to register with. And also, just like usual, you need to specify the whole list, which I did not feel like copying and pasting into a half point font on here, of your public services for every public router. And because the private, well, because by default, the service will only register with its local pub private router, you also just need to list all the services in all your private router registration. Just to make sure everyone knows where all your services are. And so the changes here for the gateway, very simple. You just need to tell it where to find its public router to send its requests, which will just still be the local public router, just like normal. So assuming that we already had this set up in place for when we got that fun query, what would we get now? And you can see here, we've got some extra arrows, which are very, very technical. That is helping out here. So as long as the registrations were accepted and everything's happy, we do still have some dead services on app one. That's a bummer, they'd be missed. But the routers on app two, or no, the routers on app one rather, know about the services on app two and they say, I can still fix this. I will send my request to the other machine. It will be responded to. Everyone will be happy. Your users need not know that they have broken something because it's not your fault, clearly. <laughs> but this way you can limp along, still, still filling requests until your monitoring system yells at you and says, hey, would you kindly restart vCrud on app one because it fell over? And you can dig through the logs and find out why. So having done all that, now we can move on to declaring victory and patting ourselves on the back. 15 whole minutes. Yeah, I think it was a good, good talk. Or there is perhaps another thing or two that we could look at. So this is very scalable. You know how to add two backends. Maybe now you can have 10 
I have literally done that. Maybe didn't need to, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but you can add as many as you like, but perhaps some of you have getting, gotten a large number of requests from a popular discovery service and you would just like to add some more web front ends and you don't need 15 copies of every service running. You just like another copy of Nginx and Apache. Or you do have some very interesting clients. Web services are fine, but you would like another 18 copies of Picra. I don't know what you're doing, but you can do that. Let's see how. So this is kind of the end goal of what we want to do. We want to separate all the web front end stuff from our evergreen services running on the back ends. And you could take this as far as you'd like. You could have the backend services on a totally separate subnet that cannot reach the outside world. Follow your heart on that, do whatever you like. But the goal here is to just get them separated enough that we can add one or more of the other without having a full stack running everywhere. So if we just zoom in on one set, here we've got the one front end, one services back end. They each need public and private routers. The names are not that important. You could name them. You could use diceware passwords if you like, but you do need to be able to resolve them through DNS. And public and private just kind of helps us follow along. So the reason for having these two sets of routers Let's say we were only running the routers with all the rest of the services. Gateways are only going to talk to one public router. That's where they send their messages. If you turn off one of the back ends, you've just killed one of your gateways or more. So if we have routers on both sides and services register with all the routers everywhere, you can just turn off a front end, nothing goes wrong, turn off a back end. So also nothing goes wrong because there are services everywhere that can handle these requests. And you might wonder why when a gateway only uses a public router, do we need private routers on the front ends? And the answer is that deep inside the Perl code for like the GCAT loader say, there are some client calls you can't trigger, like you can't just say, hey, I would like you to give me all of this private data. But the uh, OPAC modules deep down really need that. So they're going to make these private router calls behind Apache's back so that OPAC will actually work. So we don't do much with that router, but we do need to still register a full set of services to it so your OPACs will work. The changes that you need to do in the OpenSurf core, not terribly complicated. Keep your gateways pointed to their local public router. Uh, you do need to turn on client, set client to true in the OpenSurf section so that your logs will have the necessary thread traces. Otherwise, it's a lot of fun just trying to guess which log, uh, log lines are related. And then you still define local, public, and private routers down in the router section. This obviously is the web front end version of OpenSurf Core. The services back end version one could just be missing the gateway section entirely because nothing uses it. And two is set up just the same way it was before. There's no need for it to even know about the front end other than the list of routers to register with. And then of course, once you've got all this set up, there's a couple lesser used OSERF control commands that you need to be aware of, like uh, just starting the routers, which probably not a lot of people do. They're start all, stop all, they're very convenient, they handle things, except when you've got say 15 routers 
a nice odd number. So you got a nice 10 routers, two of each. Uh, you don't necessarily want to just restart them all or restart them randomly because they only know about the services that have registered with them since they started. And if you, let's say you restart the routers on app two, it now knows about the services running on app two and that's it. So next you have to use this guy, which is run on every system that has services running and it will tell all the local services, hey, just remind all the routers that you know of that you're still here. So this way, uh, when you re-register all of your services with all the different routers, your entire network will know where all the services are. And if you do not do this, you'll end up with sort of a hot paths, say, or uneven distribution of messages. So you might have three front ends. They will only send their messages to one back end for some reason. That's going to be a bad day for you to figure out why you're getting some load issues when it looks like three or four of your back end services really aren't doing anything. So this is a great way to make sure messages will run smoothly throughout your whole network. And also, I'm, I assume it goes without saying, uh, all of these eJabberD and OSERF core changes only take effect on restart for the most part. So clearly, you know, you have to do a total restart after making some of these changes to make sure everything's taking effect. And then finally, one of my goals here, the reason I said I will present on this is one, I actually learned some things depressingly as early as late as today about how some of this works. But also we need some of this documented. I have apparently volunteered myself to start writing this, but none of the stuff that I am giving you right now is the final word on anything. I, as soon as this is available, would encourage or request even that some of you help fill in the blanks so that in the future, we can all do a better job of making sure our customers get, well, not customers, sometimes our own systems all can run as reliably and resiliently as possible. So knowing me, no word on when this will be available, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I will make as much noise as I can once there is something people can start adding to. And the reason for this little slide here is, this is one of the things that I would like to also go into more depth on, which I did not have time to squeeze in today, where maybe you've got multiple backend services VMs that are all running through a single pair of, of routers. This way you can do things like maybe both of those services squares are running pcrud. So now you've got double the number of drones without cranking up max children, say to 50 or 80. So this sort of thing, not terribly complicated. I'm guessing a few of you could already figure that out given no more than I've said today, but this is the sort of thing that is not particularly well documented. And so having said all that, we're actually done. <laughs> I uh, would love, no, I would invite you to ask some questions. <laughs> I'm not going to guarantee answers, but you will get a response. Yes. I probably have more questions. But so you're using SS communication to DNS messages. Well, they need, well, you could use IPs if you're feeling that way. But. My question was this. Uh, with local host entry for, and not directly for using those DNS packets, probably. Well, local host, no, because that's local. And well, I mean, I mean DNS host style. Oh, oh, yes, you can use Etsy hosts. Yeah. 
And then and that last slide is where you're talking about running just the basic one router and then having service run. Yeah, the you don't even have to have eJab or D running on every machine that has a service running. So yeah, that that was say the one on the left had eJab or D routers and some services. The one on the right only had services. Yeah. So let me explain. Like, I don't. We're hoping that we do now. Well, the way our setup we had is Econox originally set it up with this service that we could wait the wind source machines that air mimic the Then uh, there were two drone servers. So the Brickhead also ran the router and a couple of servers, like a setting server, one other server, I think. Yeah. Service is frequently somewhere else, yeah, to keep it running all the time. Yeah, yeah but we had a couple of services that ran on the Brickhead. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. That's just how it was set up when I kept that. Then the two drone servers, they didn't run routers. Mm -hmm. They were set up to talk to the Brickhead. Had to do there was something one extra thing in eJeopardy that I forget what I had to do so that they could talk from machine to machine. Yeah. Um, actually, I think we just added hosting. They needed to be trusted uh, yeah, or, clients, or, or, perhaps. Yeah. So, so we didn't, we didn't do SS. Okay. So each brick was like its own self contained unit. Mm. So that's and kind of a hybrid then of that yeah. last slide plus the early L Director D slides. Yeah. yeah. Which I, I should admit I am aware of brick stuff. That's this is not all new. So but yeah, go ahead. But I guess one thing I what's your opinion on maybe running one router for like a whole bunch? front ends and then would you really or would it be better to have like a router on each it's nice to have it everywhere because if you've only got the one router running now there's one place that if something breaks it's real broken where I have seen actually the routers die on just the front end or the back end and then that one is messed up but it's not all falling down around you Anybody else? If you have, um, I'm assuming that the slides would be available. Do you have oh, yeah. a list of sample configuration files that you took the trip from? Like, I've wanted to do this for years. Like, it's been a sort of podcast comment one day. Uh, my browser said, Oh, yeah, you should register all the things. And I was like, But where? And I've, I've sort of been lost on that point for literally years now. Um, so I would love to see like a cleaned up, to be private, but with an example of that. Yeah, um, I, that is actually part of what I was thinking with that sample documentation is that we need the bare minimum that you need to go build one of these, just play with like, I don't know. Four VMs. You don't actually need L Director D to experiment. Um, but yes, and really the changes that I showed are enough, as long as you just do replace the right thing in your files. But yes, um, there's no problem with uh, having real examples. <laughs> Well, and the interesting thing, you'll notice I never said opensurf.xml once. Right. So all of this stuff is handled by the core config, which only really has three sections. Uh, so yeah, that should not be too bad to get some good examples going. Yes. One of the reasons I don't have great examples is I go poke around at real stuff and say, oh, that's why we're doing that. Yeah, it's a 
Well, no. <laughs> well, that's actually, there is one easy recommendation, two of each, and then see what happens. Um, obviously, I have a little background on your situation. Maybe start with five. <laughs> But uh, as far as actual, if you see this number of requests, add or remove one, I don't have that kind of stuff handy, no. I will say that we generally run like a max child of 15 for Apache even. So you don't need a ton of Apache processes, which is great because they're fat on RAM. But um, if you have all the stuff routed correctly, you can serve messages surprisingly thinly as far as resources are concerned. But yeah, that was, in your case, I was thinking maybe five of each, just, yeah, I mean, well, to start, because like I said, maybe you do have a discovery service that sends you 10,000 requests an hour, you can shunt them off to just one or two and forget about what happens because their uptime is not your problem, but you don't want all of your customers competing with that. And that would actually be an IP tables thing, not exactly load balancing. Leave. that is actually our time if there are no more questions i'm as surprised as you are that it actually ran the full length so look forward to seeing some of you at the rest of the uh, conference and uh, hopefully with all less stress thanks